Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. So today we're going to be covering the next case in the privacy series for constitutional law that I've been covering over the last couple of weeks. And that case is, yes, we're here. It's Roe v. Wade. It's time to get contentious. So before we hop into the facts of this particular case, if you like the content on my channel, do me a favor and give me a, a subscribe. And if you like this video or you have a rager for this video and just can't help yourself, go ahead and hit that like button just till he turns blue. I say it every time and every time it's still true. It really does help the algorithm, um, gets the video in front of more people and I always appreciate it. So thanks in advance. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the facts of this particular case. Now it arises out of the state of Texas back in the early 70s and the law at issue in this particular case was one that is not that unusual in that it outlawed abortion except in cases of risk of health to the mother. Now, Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, whose real name was actually Norman McCorvey, uh, was in Texas and was asking the court there to prevent the state of Texas from enforcing this particular ban. Now, she was unmarried and pregnant at the time and had wanted a doctor to perform an abortion because that's where you could get one safely. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to get her hands on the procedure because her life was not in danger at the time and she didn't have enough money to travel to a different state. In asking the court to stop the state of Texas from enforcing this particular ban, she raised two particular arguments. One was related to her right to privacy, which was grounded in the Griswold and the Eisenstadt and the Loving cases that I've been discussing over the last few weeks. And the second argument was an interesting one and one that we haven't covered before, and it was a claim of vague now, this is a bit of a side note, but laws are often written either rather broadly or very narrowly, depending on what you want them to do and how they're supposed to be applied. But here's the thing. A law can't be so vague that it makes it impossible to enforce without, say, guessing or having to try and assume what the legislators intended when they passed the law. And so one challenge to any particular piece of legislation is vagueness. And in this instance, that's exactly what Roe was saying. And more even to the point, she had doctors that were saying the law was too vague and they weren't able to determine whether they could or could not perform an abortion because they couldn't determine what life of the mother and threat to it meant in terms of the legislation. And because they weren't able to make that determination for themselves, most doctors simply refused to perform abortions in order to prevent violating the law. So the Supreme Court picked this thing up on appeal and they dove headlong into history and determining what abortion was, for lack of a better term. They started out back with the Greeks and the Romans in ancient times, trying to figure out when life began. The ultimate question that none of us will ever actually be able to answer, but we try so very hard. And even looking back into Greek and Roman history, the court noted that there was a difference of opinion opinion even then as to when life began or when it was sacred or should be protected. And so that didn't do them too much good. So they looked forward into English common law. Again, our basis of law in the United States following our particular history. And what they noted there was something slightly different. So at the common law, abortion was generally legal, non-indictable, so long as you did it before the quickening, which sounds like a highland movie, but no, quickening was the term that used to be used for the first movement of the child or fetus or however you want to describe it by the mother, right? The first time you could feel it moving itself. That movement, the quickening, was when at common law the fetus, the child, was considered to be a person, for lack of a better term, in this instance, and abortion would no longer be considered acceptable. Before that, go right ahead, and it was generally um, common for reasons that occur today. Things like an inability to support the child, an unwanted pregnancy, perhaps rape, or some other unfortunate incident. Fun little 
side note to this part, in Christian theology, they actually set the date differently between boys and girls as to when they were quickened in a more general sense. They rather presumed that for boys it started at 40 days, but for girls it started at 80, which if you then apply the previous standard of acceptability of abortion makes for a very interesting state. And this view generally held true up through the 19th century. But moving now into the 19th century, you saw a shift. And this is sort of the beginning of what we tend to think of as abortion restrictions and laws began in the early, early 19th century with the first English statutory abortion law coming up in about 1803, which focused on aborting fetuses that could have been born alive. So what we would largely think of as like a late term abortion. But even in that instance, the law did provide an exception for the life of the mother. And that was taken as a good faith state. In the United States, we held on to the English common law concept and system up until about the mid 1800s or so. And as time went on, we added more and more abortion laws in the United States. Some with the limitations as to health of the mother and some without. Though it should also be noted that with time in the run-up to Roe v. Wade, some states were actually starting to liberalize the concept on their own, expanding access state by state. In making the arguments to the Supreme Court, the representative for Texas put forward two basic arguments. Um, one was related to health and the requirement of the state to consider health and protect the health of the citizenry. And in this particular regard, they were leaning quite heavily on the fact that abortion up until it was made illegal, which again, timing, um, was unsanitary and generally unsafe. And so regulating it was actually to the healthful benefit of the mother, right? The woman in this particular case. And to a certain degree, there's some logic in that insofar as we're talking about the early to mid late 19th century, where germ theory is only a twinkle in most doctors' eyes and ether has only hit the scene. Um, the argument doesn't hold quite as much water as you get into the 20th century and things like antibiotics and sterile surgery really start taking off. But they also advanced another interesting argument, and that is that a state has an interest in protecting life. And they made the point of saying that this life includes prenatal life. Now, some of this you can see in more general statutes when we think of murder or assault and battery, right? The idea is that the state is protecting your life by making it illegal to kill you or to harm you in a significant physical way. And and for Texas's purpose when it comes to the prenatal life, they made a point of saying that they considered life to begin at conception, which I'm sure is a term that many of you have heard. So the court in this case took the historical precedent that they looked at, they took a look at Texas's arguments, and they weighed them against the previous case law that we've been discussing. So they looked to the zone of privacy, which has been discussed quite thoroughly and protected by the Constitution um, in the Griswold case, in Einstadt, in Loving v. Virginia, all of those things. And the court found that the decisions make it clear that only personal rights that can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty are included in this guarantee of personal privacy. But, and this is a big but, privacy is not an absolute right. And the state does actually have some interest in protecting things like health and life but in looking at the totality, the court did finally determine that the right to direct the course of your own pregnancy as a woman is a right so fundamental to personal liberty that it is actually protected under the 14th Amendment. In finding so, the court determined that the harm that could be done to the woman from such an unwanted pregnancy was severe and apparent. These things included distress, 
physical, emotional, mental harm, along with some amount of societal stigma for unwed mothers. So when balancing the two competing interests, the right of the state to regulate aspects of life and health and safety against the privacy right of the individual woman to direct her own pregnancy or other privacy rights, the court was very clear when they said that where certain fundamental rights are involved, the court has held that regulation limiting these rights must be justified only by a compelling state interest and that legislative enactments must be narrowly drawn to express only the legitimate state interests at stake. And what's interesting is that language is now often also applied to other areas of the law in the constitutional sense. So the standard of review for some law that is a fundamental right ends up being compelling state interest narrowly tailored. The court then moved into something of an analysis about the fetus itself and what, well, lack of a better term, what to do with it. So the court ended up actually getting into an analysis of whether or not the fetus was a person under the law. And they took a look again at the history that we discussed earlier of how abortion has been handled in the past, whether by the Romans, the English common law, or the later statutory laws. And in their evaluation, they determined that a fetus is not a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment. But the court did say that a mother's privacy right isn't hers alone, and it becomes less and less hers as time goes on. So as the fetus gets older, it develops more and more of that personhood and can demand more and more protection from the law. And it's at the point, some point, where there's a tip in that scale of the fetus's age where all of a sudden the state does actually get to have some say in what happens to it and the court called that the compelling interest point for purposes of abortion the court in Roe determined that that point was at the first trimester so the first 12 weeks at that point at the end of the 12th week the state had a compelling interest in health and was able to regulate the medical procedures and things like how it was done and where it was done and who could do it but before that 12th week the state had no compelling interest in the fetus and therefore could not prevent the abortion. But when it came to the state interest in life, that was a slightly different analysis and the court ended up finding that that interest kicked in at viability, as in when the fetus could survive on its own outside the mother. And the state would be able at that point to ban abortion outright. So two different standards in terms of the state interest in health and the ability to regulate who can conduct abortions and how and what the requirements of them may be. That's 12 weeks for the standards of state interest in life. That would be at the point of viability. When that occurs, the state has the ability to ban abortion outright. So for that rather long-winded discussion, the end result was the, the Supreme Court found that the ban as laid out in Texas was unconstitutional under the privacy right. And because it's grounded in the constitutional principle, it also applies applied nationwide. And as a result, we then had access to legal abortion nationwide. Now, what's interesting is that most people know about the Roe v. Wade case. What they don't know is about the additional abortion-related cases that came thereafter, and we will get to those at a later date, but please be aware that Roe v. Wade is not the settled final law on this particular issue. So that was Roe v. Wade, as promised. Um, hopefully it wasn't too painful. It was a rather long case. It was a fairly long case to read. I'd forgotten just how wordy it actually was, um, but I hope you enjoyed, and go ahead and reach out out and comment below. In particular, I'd love to know what you think about the idea of personhood for purposes of the law, but I hope you enjoyed, and until we have a chance to meet again, I hope you're well.